31 in your Bible, you'll notice it, how short it is. It's three verses. I'm going to read the whole chapter, and we're going to spend our time thinking about it together as a church this morning. This is a song of David. It's in the, uh, the Psalms of Ascent. There were um, uh, 13, 14, 14, 15 psalms uh, right around here that were written... Um, we don't know exactly the context of all of them, but we think the most likely explanation is that as pilgrims were making their spiritual journey up to Jerusalem, uh, that these would be the psalms that they would have memorized and sung on their way to worship uh, at the temple in Jerusalem, and they were spiritual reminders that they needed along the way. So let me read Psalm 131, starting here in verse 1. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. God, would you help us to understand what these words mean, even as they're David's testimony, would they become increasingly our testimony? Um, would you help these things to be true? And so we need you to work in our hearts so that we would know and understand what's here, that you would point out places and ways that we are not living, um, not just as we should, but we're not living in light of the glorious realities of what a relationship with you looks like. So help us apply these things to our hearts and lives, we ask in Christ's name, amen. So, Pastor Kevin, this is kind of a weird way to start the service. Did I leave my little uh, self-forgetfulness booklet at the end of the pew there? If not, can you get one of those books from the offices and bring them to me? My bad, thank you. Especially if you can find the one that has my bookmark so I know which page I'm turning to. <laughs> Yikes. Um, that has nothing to do with the sermon. Here we go. Um, Psalm 131, you get two pictures of the human soul. They're kind of contrasted with one another. Um, on the one hand, you, you get a picture of what we might say uh, uh, is a noisy soul, a soul that is disrupted, a soul that's not at rest, a soul that's not quiet, a soul that's arrogant and haughty and lifted up, and it's, it's a soul that's never going to be satisfied and at rest. And on the other hand, that's compared and contrasted with a soul that is, that is quiet, that is calm, that is confident, that is truly at rest with its God. I love the, the picture on the screen. If any of you have seen a body of water perfectly still and at rest. Um, if, if you go out to a body of water upon a, a the lake uh, early in the morning, the tiniest little ripple will show up. The tiniest drop of water will create a large commotion. And this is the picture in the psalm here that there's David's soul is calm and at rest. David's soul is one that that doesn't need, David's soul is one that is so, so at rest, so satisfied in God, so filled with peace, thank you so much, that there is no disruption, there is no unrest, there is no, there is nothing causing a disturbance. To try to illustrate this, uh, the psalmist uses a picture that we'll see if we can, if we can do this this morning. If we still, so some of you kids, by the way, kids, that was awesome, you coming up here and singing your song, the theme song to Awana. So if you're here and you're like four, five, six, or seven, something like that, and if your mom is sitting next to you or a grandma or somebody down the row, if you want to like go, cr right now, I need your help to illustrate a soul at rest so those of you that are four, five, six, and seven, listen to me. Would you like go crawl into your mom's lap right now if she'll let you? Go, literally, go crawl. By the way, there's no age limit on this. You know, if some of your guys' moms are there and you want to go, go, go back and find your mom, have your mom give you a big hug, right? Lean into your mom. Snuggle there, right? Okay? Now, if you're able to watch that, if you can see that, 
for so many of these kids, right? And even if this wasn't your experience as a child, you can relate to what it would have been like. This, to be in mom's arms, that's when you're at rest. That's when everything's okay. And it really doesn't matter what's going wrong in the world. Right? It doesn't matter how loud that thunderstorm is. It doesn't matter what mean thing the kid said to you on the playground. It doesn't matter how hard your sibling hit you. When mom wraps you up, well, then everything's okay. Well, that's the psalmist picture here. And he's going to compare and contrast that with an inner person, an inner soul, who's, who's noisy, who's not at rest, who can't be satisfied no matter what is going on in their life. So how do we get that, right? How do we have a quieted soul? What's this confident, quieted, peaceful soul that David is talking about. This Psalm 131, it's kind of an Old Testament picture of what Paul says in Philippians. You don't need to turn there, but in, in the New Testament letter of Philippians, Paul's writing about how great the gospel is, and he's writing about how much joy it brings into the believer's life. And and he even says at the end of chapter 4, he says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What is it like to have that kind of peace? A better peace than anyone can wrap their mind around. It surpasses all understanding. To not be noisy with the anxieties and concerns of the world, but to have calmed and quieted our soul such that we have peace that surpasses all understanding. In Psalm 131, David is not talking to us as much as he's letting us watch him talk to God. He's having a conversation with God, almost talking to himself. He's recounting his own personal testimony. This is how I got to peace. This is how I trusted in God. And the fact that David's the author of this psalm, well, that's kind of interesting. Like many of the authors of Scripture, David wrote better than he lived. And David's early years were certainly filled with a quiet, trusting confidence in God. He had circumstances later in life where where he didn't follow his own advice in this psalm as well as he ought to have. And yet his heart truly was after God. He, 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 he truly was someone who wanted to follow God. We can learn from this advice. And ultimately, in Psalm 131, this is David's experience. But the greater David, the child of David, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came from David's line, he's the one who has lived this experience truer than any. He is the one who perfectly had a soul quietly at rest, even amidst the chaos of his short years here on this earth. So we can learn from his example, even as we look at David's example. We're going to look at these three verses, and here's what we're going to see. We're going to see three things to learn from David about a quiet, confident, restful soul. Three things to learn from David about a quiet, confident, restful soul. We're going to look at this. We're going to see, first of all, what David wasn't. He tells us what he wasn't. Then he's going to tell us what he is. So we're going to look at what David wasn't. We're going to look at what David was. And then we're going to look at David's advice to us. Let's look at verse 1, what David wasn't. Verse 1 says this, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. David speaks to God and he he diagnoses, he addresses, he looks at his own heart and he says, God, here's what's true about my heart. And when he says that his heart is not lifted up, he's speaking about pride. He's speaking about an arrogant spirit. These are the phrases of Scripture. These are the phrases that Scripture uses to describe pride, to describe arrogance. When he says his eyes are not raised, he's also talking about pride. To to have raised eyes is the English equivalent of looking down our nose at other people, right? So it's, it's not just pride. It's pride in comparison to others. I can lift my eyes up when I'm around others that I have deemed myself superior to. And this is David's point. 
In Proverbs chapter 30, we've got these verses for you on the screen. I, I want to just read the way that wisdom literature speaks about eyes being lifted up, and it speaks of uh, wicked people are the ones who have eyes lifted up. In Proverbs chapter 30, starting in verse 11, there are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. These are wicked people, it says. They are those who clean who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. There are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high their eyelids lift. There are those whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives, to devour the poor from off the earth to the needy from among mankind. Throughout Scripture, haughty eyes, lifted eyes, is a sign of pride, it's a sign of evil. In Proverbs chapter 6, um, Haughty eyes are among the six things that the Lord hates, the seven that are an abomination. Haughty eyes are on that list. So what you see David saying here is, is, is that he's not someone who has that prideful, arrogant spirit. He's not someone who has the lifted eyes. And here's the thing, as the verse keeps going, when we have a haughty, arrogant spirit, we begin to presume on our own ability to accomplish things that are not in the Lord's plans for us. We begin to think we have that ability to go outside God's commands for us. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. That's David's testimony. I haven't tried to, I haven't set about to master things that are above my pay grade. That's what David is saying at this point. Throughout the Old Testament scriptures, wonderful things frequently belong to the Lord's accomplishments. If you just flip like one page in your Bible to Psalm 136 verse 4, we have it for you on the screen. Psalm 136 it speaks of giving thanks to the Lord. His steadfast love endures forever. Why do we give thanks to the Lord? Because to Him alone, Him who alone does great wonders, For his steadfast love endures forever. The wondrous things, the wonderful things, are the things the Lord does. And David says, that's not what occupies my thoughts. I'm not setting out to be like God in the number of things that I accomplish. David is saying that he's not too big for his britches. He stays in his lane. He's not God. He's not trying to be. Have you ever thought about what gives you a noisy soul? What makes it so difficult to say we have a quiet soul? You see, when we begin to lift up our eyes and puff up our own ability, our own accomplishments, and we begin to occupy ourselves with things that are above our pay grade, when we try to put ourselves in God's shoes, it will only lead to noisy souls, to souls that can find no rest. David Pallison says it this way, Most of the noise in our souls is generated by trying to control the uncontrollable. We grasp after the wind. We rage, fear, and finally, despair. So how how do you see this play out in your life? In ways where your eyes get lifted up, you begin to consume yourself with things that you shouldn't be consuming yourself. We have our our wired kids in with us this morning. By the way, we adults do this just as much as young kids. Young kids, how do you, wh- where does this happen and play out in your life, right? If you're with us and not down and wired this morning. You know when you get, might see yourself getting too proud and worried about things you ought not be worried about? It plays out among school playgrounds all over the place, right? Bigger, faster, stronger than other kids. We all have that desire, do you, little kids, do you ever, you know, as you watch YouTube, do you ever desire to have a YouTube channel with millions of followers? What would that be like, you think to yourself, as you watch it playing out in the world? As you get a little older in the scale, and some of the teens, and you, do you, ever, do you ever want to be the best looking among your peers? Why do we consume ourselves with that, or places we think we fall short that we don't measure up? Tim Keller talks about the way that um, th- that, that pride and this comparison to others, how quickly this, this happens. And it leads to a noisy soul. And we begin to occupy ourselves with things that, that we ought not. 
Tim Keller wrote this uh, little book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness, and, and just as a precursor to a commercial, Craig Beatty is going to teach through some of this material in uh, upcoming Shawnee studies. Does that start next week? And um, that I'm aware of, Tim Keller never references Psalm 131 in, his, in this material. Uh, but if this morning's sermon resonates with you and you want to dig further into these concepts, I would encourage you to jump in on, on that class because there's a lot of parallel thoughts. So he, when pride can be so tricky in the way that it leads to a noisy soul. And Tim Keller uh, quotes from C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. He has a pretty well-known chapter on pride. And this is what C.S. Lewis has to say. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something only out of having more of it than the next person. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better-looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good-looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. So then Tim Keller goes and he comments on C.S. Lewis' words. He says, in other words, we're only proud of being more successful, more intelligent, more good-looking than the next person. And when we are in the presence of someone who is more successful, intelligent, and good-looking than we are, we lose all pleasure in what we had. That is because we really had no pleasure in it. We were proud of it. When we lift our eyes, when our heart gets haughty, When we try to put ourselves in a place that only God ought to be, it always leads to a noisy soul. And in in the first part of the verse, David is saying, I'm not proud. And in the second part of the verse, he's saying, not only am I not proud, but I don't let my pride drive me into reckless, unchecked ambition. I'm not trying to to, to make a name for myself and achieve things that God doesn't want me to achieve. We, we have noisy souls, many of us, because of this drive to do and to accomplish. There's a place that Christians are supposed to accomplish, but where? How does, how does that fit in to what David is talking about here, because David is saying that it's a problem when his soul is occupied and tied up with things that are too wonderful and too marvelous and that are above his pay grade. Eugene Peterson comments on Psalm 131, and he does a good job capturing uh, the wrestle that goes on in the human heart for this. He says this, because of the fact that Here's where the wrestle is uniquely difficult for us in the Western world in 2024. He's speaking about our culture, and he says, It's difficult to recognize pride as sin when it is held up on every side as a virtue. It's urged as profitable and rewarded as an achievement. What is described in Scripture as basic sin The sin of taking things into your own hands, being your own God, grabbing what is there while you can get it, is now described as basic wisdom. Improve yourself by whatever means you're able. Get ahead regardless of the price. Take care of me first. For a limited time it works, he says, but at the end the devil has his due. There is damnation. Our our souls will never be at rest as long as we are striving to take God out of the picture and accomplish things that we have no business accomplishing. We've got to be able to make a distinction. What David is cautioning against and saying has no place in his soul is this godless ambition. So where is the place for godly aspiration, you might say? Right? What's the scriptural... if, If... If an unchecked ambition is going to send us down the road of pride, where's the place for a godly aspiration? See, godly aspiration recognizes and understands that God has given us things to accomplish, purposes, tasks in this world for his glory. David was the king of Israel. He wasn't against accomplishment. He wasn't against achievement. But he knew how to stay in his lane for the glory of God 
achieving what God had him to do. A reckless, unchecked ambition does one of two things. It either removes God entirely, or it remakes God into our own image. That's the problem sometimes, that we, even in the church, we don't call it pride, we call it accomplishing something great for God. Taking big risks so that God would get the glory. But we have taken God out of the picture. We've remade God into our image and we just want our own name to be great. We just want our own achievements. We just think that the way to a quiet soul will be if I can do enough, accomplish enough, be enough. And we put spiritual language of spiritual vision, spiritual leadership, spiritual accomplishment... And David would look at it and say it's occupying ourselves with things too wonderful and too great if God is out of the picture. So think through this. Are there places where you are proud? Are there places where your eyes are raised up? Where your soul is noisy because you're trying to control the uncontrollable in things that God has not given you to try to control? Are you trying to take on more pressure than you can handle? Parents, think about this in the ways that we are raising our kids. Uh, our, our kids face pressure to achieve or surrounding all sides. And we've got to be mindful of it, just thinking through, what are we teaching our kids will truly satisfy? Is it the grades? Is it the achievement? Is it the status? I hope you're paying attention to... Uh, some of the research that's being done, parents, in the, in the dangers of social media for young children and, and the, the, the pressure that that place is to achieve, to be, to look. And kids don't have the, that's too high and too wondrous in some of their developmental abilities to, to, to put themselves into that world. And adults suffer from the same ambitions, some of the same unchecked ambitions. It's, there's a, a remarkable amount of studies that speak to anxiety levels among teens today uh, that for teens in well-to-do neighborhoods where achievement is expected and the norm, anxiety levels are much higher than in inner city, poor income, places where like there's actually threats and dangers of, of uh, violence because of some of that internal unchecked ambitions and what happens, right? Pay attention to some of those things even in, as we try to shepherd our kids and help them understand what is it that will truly lead to a quiet, restful soul? What is it that creates noise in your soul where you haven't come to rest in peace with God's assignment for your life? The, the true path to a contented peace is not to try to put more on my plate than God ever intended, but a contented, calm, quiet spirit that says, I'm content with the assignment God has given me, and that's what I'm going to do for his honor and glory. We need to recognize that as God's people. So David wasn't proud and lifted up. What was he? Look at verse 2. Here's what David was. He says this, I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. This David now, this time, he's telling us positively what he did do. He had to calm and quiet his soul. What is David saying? What does this mean? If I've spent the first whole part of this sermon saying that reckless ambition is not the option, where does that leave us, right? And some of you say, look, I don't want to be someone who accomplishes nothing. I don't want to be someone who doesn't have any drive, some of you are worried that you've grown up in cultures and now you're in workplaces and societies and your, your circle of those you interact with is, look, if you, if you don't get out in front of other people, they're going to run over you. So where does that leave you? Is, is David advocating that we're just supposed to be a bunch of doormat Christians who never try to accomplish anything and we don't ever get worried about anything? David Pallison says it this way, get a clear picture of what Psalm 131 is not. It does not portray blissful, unruffled detachment. It's not a meditative state of higher consciousness. It's not stoic indifference. It's not becoming philosophical about life. It's not having an easygoing personality or having low expectations so that you're easy to please. It's not retreat from the troubles of life 
and the commotion of other people. It's not retirement to a life of ease and wealth, the quiet of having nothing to do and no worries. It's not the pleasant fatigue that follows a hard day's work or a hard workout. It's not the quieting of inner noise that a glass of wine or a daily dose of Prozac produces. After all, Jesus and David were both kingdom builders in real life, real time. They expected and achieved huge things in the midst of commotion and trouble. They experienced pressure, joy, heartache, outrage, affection, courage. So Psalm 131's inner quiet comes in the midst of actions, relationships, and problems. Catch this of the way that David found a quiet soul. Do you see what he says in verse 2? He says, I have calmed and quieted my soul. That means at one point his soul wasn't calm. It means at one point his soul wasn't quiet. We know what it's like to have chaotic lives, to have worlds filled with stress, to have more on our plate than we can handle. To feel a pressure that there's so many things on my plate that I am occupied with. And here's David saying, I've not occupied myself with those pressures. How how did he get there? In the providence of God, as as we move to Psalm 131, I was anxious to to look into this psalm. In my own spiritual life, I would say I only kind of ran across this psalm about a year ago. Some 40 years into my life. And it has been a special psalm to me for the last year. And I thought perhaps I understood parts of it. And this week I decided to take a deep dive about how to find calm, how to find peace, how to find rest. By the way, Lord willing, my family and I, we are looking forward to spending a couple of weeks in Virginia. We leave later this week and we're just going to rest. We spend time with family, enjoy God's goodness. Those of you with kids know that, you know, vacations with kids are not always restful. (laughs) I'll miss being with you. You are a special people, but we, so here I am in the week leading up to this, anticipating rest, like this psalm will help me get to rest, right? Maybe I'll be able to calm and quiet my soul, and in God's providence, this week, nothing crazy happened in my, in my life as Aaron Hart, the dad, the pastor, but all kinds of little things. It was like there was more on my plate this week than in a long time, in a good way. It was just like God was like, okay, you want to learn about quiet? Here, try this and this and this and this and this and that and that and this. There's a whole bunch of you coming off of VBS week this week that like your tank is on empty. There's no way to get a calm, quiet soul because you're on empty, right? I had no idea that in the providence of God, the chaos of the political events that we watched yesterday, 12 hours before I would preach, my heart would just, instead of like focusing and fixing on the sermon, my heart just wanted to read headline after headline. What, what happened? What does this mean? Where are we at? By the way, parents, I'm trying to be careful with my words and not say much, not because I'm trying to be neutral about the heinous actions of what took place, but because I recognize there's kids and don't want to spoil news. My heart is like, okay, well, how do I get to a calm, quiet soul? Because this, this is not, this is chaos. This is the opposite of rest. When, when Charles Spurgeon preached on Psalm 131, this is what he said. And you have this quote at the bottom of your notes. It's one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. I think its lesson will take us all of our lives. And whether you're eight years old or 80, we've got to learn how to calm and quiet our souls It's a process. We don't start there. And somehow in the midst of chaos, we have to learn, in the midst of the assignments that God has given us, in the midst of the responsibilities that he's put on our plate, we have to learn how to quiet our soul. And David uses this really neat picture, a picture of a child with its mother. And I I, want to get into that picture before I do. Those of you that were here at VBS this week, we've got a picture we learned about a child with its mother and several of the sea creatures do you, any of you remember Finley? Was Finley on Tuesday? 
So we watched all these videos of these characters that live in the sea and they told us about life and the way that God created them and they, they told us about the, the, how different things illustrated their relationship with God. Well, Finley, by the way, dolphins, fin. Dolphin, Finley, get it? So Finley was here to tell us that dolphin calves, dolphin babies, we've got a picture of this, they swim in the baby position. They, they get right in close next to their mother and they swim right there. Do you remember what Finley said in the video? Finley said this. Finley said that when I, fin, Finley said, I always feel safe by my mom's side. And that's the picture that David uses. But he talks about a wean child with its mother. You can take that picture off. What does it mean for a wean child to feel safe next to its mother, to be at rest? We've got to wrap our minds around that because that's, that's a little bit of a hard picture to catch. But if, if you take a six-month-old baby and put it with its mom, a six-month-old baby who's nursing and hungry and who's awake, and if like, what's, moms, what's the stopwatch? 3.7 seconds? I mean, if once that baby's in your lap, if that baby is not getting what it craves, the milk that it desires to eat, that baby is not at rest, right? I mean, you have like 3.7 seconds and then... Ah! Now, in the ancient cultures, they would often nurse maybe up to like, you know, a little bit older toddler. And so you take, you take that same child, T take a three or four year old now, right, that's weaned. And now that baby, even if it's hungry, sitting in mom's lap. Well, what has happened in the three years since? Right? I'm sorry, moms. But at six months old, this baby does not have a deep love for you because it knows everything about you and just thinks you're amazing. It's starting to, but mostly sees you as a source of sustenance for life and food. Right? But by three years old, there's a relationship there. And there's a knowledge. And there's a... Now, what I once so needed from mom, even if mom doesn't give it to me, my soul is at rest. The German Old Testament theologian Arter Weiser said it this way, and just as the child gradually breaks off the habit of regarding his mother only as a means of satisfying his own desires and learns to love her for her own sake, so the worshiper, after a struggle, has reached an attitude and mind in which he desires God for himself and not as a means of fulfillment of his own wishes. His life's center of gravity has shifted. He now rests no longer in himself, but in God. What's your view of God? Do you only want to get close to God when your soul is noisy so that God will just fix all the things that are making your soul noisy? That you just need God like a cosmic vending machine in the sky to give you what you want? Or has your relationship with God gotten to the point that your soul is satisfied in God, regardless of whether or not he gives you what you think you need? And that's a weaning process. And moms who have had to break their kids or go through that weaning process, it's a struggle, especially if they're three years old, like, David would have been familiar with in that cult context in society. Charles Spurgeon said, To the wean child, his mother is his comfort, though she has denied him comfort. It is a blessed mark of growth out of spiritual infancy when we can forgo the joys which once appeared to be so essential and can find our solace in him who denies them to us. Think about this Christian that goes through trials why is it that trials in the life of a Christian, they have this polarizing effect? Have you noticed? Two different things happen. There are some who profess the name of Christ that go through trials and they're embittered. Their relationship with God fractures in the sense of the closeness, the nearness, the, their love for God. And there are others that you watch that go through trials and somehow... Though they don't love the trial, the trials have the opposite effect. This person becomes content. There's a confidence maybe even there that wasn't there before. There's a sweet spirit. There is a joy-filled spirit. 
David's saying this is the key, not to think too highly of ourselves, not to try to put more on our plates than we ought to handle, but to say, I've, cal- I've learned to calm and quiet my soul so that my relationship with God is enough, even if God withholds the very thing that used to drive me, that used to cause me to find fulfillment. So what would David say to you and I? What's his advice to us in the third verse? His advice, O Israel... Hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Now and forever, hope in God. Hope in this verse is not a passive thing. It's not like maybe it will happen. Hope in the Bible is a confident expectation. It's active. It's God is the only one who can satisfy it. Only God is the one who can quiet our souls. Not our own dreams, not our own achievements. And so as we bring this to a close, here's the one thing, right? This question to ask ourselves that helps us understand. Here's the one thing. Do you hope in God or in yourself? That's what David is saying as he runs through. Is your hope in God or is your hope in yourself? When your hope is in yourself, your eyes get lifted up. When other people don't treat you the way that you expect, it's very difficult to deal with. When when your hope is in yourself, you... You look to achievement, to success, to good looks, to popularity, to friends' approval. Maybe you find hope in politics and political answers to the solutions to the problems we face. Maybe your hope is in your next vacation. That somehow this will be the fulfillment to quiet your souls. But if our hope is not in God, None of those things will help. In fact, they will simply lead to more noise in our souls. I pray that you know God and his grace through the person of Jesus Christ. That the only way to truly have relationship with him is through the forgiveness of sins in what Christ has done for us on the cross. That, that's, that's not only what pays for our sins and gives us a right relationship with God when we turn from our sins and trust in Christ. But it's also what quiets our souls. It's what gives us the inner rest that we all crave. Let's pray and ask God for his help. Lord, our hope is in you. That's what we desire. Would you cause it to be increasingly true in our lives that we would be a people who rest in you, who love you,